Today, we have Tiger Nets' Grayson Mann joining the show to talk college football in general. And make sure to check out all his work on Tiger Net and also on the Orange Crush podcast. He's releasing a really awesome interview with head coach Sean Poppy for Clemson women's basketball team. And they're going to be talking about this upcoming season and everything to it. So make sure you check it out. He's releasing it uh, later today. But again, this is Grayson Mann from Tiger Net. Grayson, thank you for joining us. How are you? Man, I'm doing great. Thanks for the shout out on the interview. We're really excited about that dropping later today. But uh, good to talk some college football, a little different change of pace from our Thursday conversations. Yeah, you're telling me, you're telling me, you know, when there's no Clemson football going on this weekend, you have to get creative with it all. But I figured there's no one better to bring in to talk the grand scheme of football when it comes to college than you, Grace. And so really looking at what uh, I guess this projection, we're at week nine of the college football season. And I think the thing that's on everyone's mind as a Clemson fan is the what if scenario. What if SMU, Clemson, and Miami all went out and Clemson doesn't get the tiebreaker, right? Which would most likely happen in this situation. Do you think Clemson, if they were to miss out on the AC championship but finish eleven and one in the regular season, do they still make the playoffs? I think yeah, I think Clemson the goal for them should be to finish eleven and one, regardless of how the ACC race plays out. We've been running some numbers at Tiger Net, and what it looks like right now, Clemson wins out with the schedule and avoiding a winless Cal in ACC play. So they're going to have enough, I think, to win the tiebreaker over a Miami or an SMU. Now, granted, Matt, and we may get into this later, I think that either one of those two teams, an SMU or Miami, is going to fall in November, at least one game. But when I look at the big field and the bigger picture, Clemson's probably going to have their one loss, their one blemish on their record to an 11 and one Georgia, 12 and one Georgia that I believe is going to win the SEC championship against Texas in December. So when you look at it, Clemson goes, "Hey, we let's say Clemson doesn't make their their conference championship. I don't think the committee could punish them for something that happens with a calculator uh, in ACC headquarters, where you're having to crunch out percentages and you just get the short end of the stick." For Clemson, you just got to win your game. I think the field, when you look at an Alabama that's likely going to lose again, uh, you, you stack up against maybe an A&M or a Notre Dame that doesn't have as good of a loss. I think Clemson's done enough and blown out enough teams where it's not like, oh, well, they're barely getting by Wake Forest. So they're barely getting by Stanford. Now, Clemson's crushing these teams. And so I think for the Tigers, it's just win your games, take care of your business, and I think things will work out for themselves. Well, I want to pose a, a an interesting question. I guess, question to you, which is, let's say Clemson does go 11 and one. They miss out on the, on the championship, right? Then SMU and Miami went out the rest of the season. Miami's 12 and 0 SMU's 11 and one SMU beats Miami and the ACC championship. SMU is automatically in. And then you have a 12 and one Miami and 11 and one Clemson. And then there's obviously going to be the Big Ten going on with all their undefeated teams like Penn State, Ohio State, Oregon. Maybe the Big 12 gets two teams in with the BYU and Iowa State. Do you think the ACC gets three teams in? And if not, out of Miami and Clemson, who gets in? Right, because it's going to come down to, okay, let's look at the schedules. Let's look so, hey, Miami made their conference title game, but as I said a couple minutes before, I don't think you could necessarily punish Clemson if it comes down to a. I mean, when we're looking at time records here, Matt, you got to scroll down a couple of their pages to even find it. So it's <laughs> a very complicated situation for all three of these teams. Uh, do I know? Let's, for the sake of hypothetical, say that happens. It could be a very interesting situation here where the Tigers may be putting their destiny in the committee's hands, and you're going to have to start rooting for teams like LSU to have a couple losses, Tennessee to have a couple losses. Maybe Iowa State or BYU trips up a little bit. Notre Dame could be a factor if they stay in on their current course. Maybe Army or Navy, uh, the current undefeated. I think Navy is at the top. All, all, excuse me, Army and Navy are both in the top yeah. 25 undefeated. Shout-out to the Service Academy and college football. There's a lot of football left to be played, and I think it, this is what makes this 12-team playoff fascinating, is even while the field has expanded, there still might be some good teams that are left out. Yeah, it, it is crazy, and I also think it shows you how the landscape of football 
is I don't want to say leveling it out, but there's more there's a lot more teams that are actually good. Right. And I think that's an ever changing landscape. I do want to talk to you about the Big 12, though. Iowa State BYU. Right. They are both undefeated teams in the Big 12, and they're on a collision course to potentially meet each other in the Big 12 championship. Two questions for you. Do you think entering the Big 12 championship that both of them will be undefeated? And if so, do you think they both get into the playoffs? You know, I think you, you and I both remember sort of texting back and forth for the Iowa State <laughs> yeah. UCS. What a, what a sweat of the game. Kind of what a sweat. Having to sweat that one out. I, I think that there's – I'm not sure I trust Iowa State as much as I do BYU. And we'll get to see BYU play the same UCF team tomorrow at 3.30. I, I could see a situation where both are undefeated, but I, it really depends on – I think what's going to be fascinating, Matt, then, is that first college football playoff ranking show – on election night and a couple, I think it's on the 5th of November, uh, about a week and a half from now, we're going to really get to see how the committee has viewed these teams from up to this point. Then we'll really get to say, okay, do they have BYU and Iowa State close? How do they maybe factor in? Do they just do a straight up top 25 and then do, well, this is what it would be if the playoffs started today? I'm curious to see how they do the show because usually it's just been a straight up, okay, these would be the top four teams and then the rest of the field. Now they're going to factor in, okay, who's technically ahead on the, in their conference race right now, and how do we factor that in? I think right now I would have to give BYU a slight edge over Iowa State just because of how they've handled their business. But at the same time, if you go 11-1 and one in your conference and your only loss is in the championship game, you got a lot of credibility to the committee to maybe force their hand to put two 12, big 12 teams in. Yeah, definitely. And I didn't even know that. That's, that's hilarious to me that the presidential election and – the CFP rankings get released on the same day. That, oh, that, yeah. That's crazy to me. That's so funny. Uh, but looking at the committee, as you mentioned, we don't know what they're thinking, obviously. But most media members like to say, well, there's an SEC bias or there's a Big Ten bias. So do you think that carries into this, like, this first rankings but also into the future? Like, Do you think that maybe to a, a regular fan's eye, the Big Ten or the SEC sneak in a team <clears throat> over another conference that was more deserving? Yeah, I think it's interesting this year, especially with the realignment, Madsen, where you have teams like Oregon in the Big Ten and Texas in the SEC, where there are bigger brands in the big boy conferences. Uh, this is just sort of how the belly of the beast is. But I think it may be a little different this year. I know fans probably can point to the FSU situation last year, where that was probably more a Jordan Travis thing than anything else. Uh, or situations in the past where TCU in 2014 gets snubbed out for an Ohio State. Uh, there's a lot of factors to uh, to look into this, Matt. And I think that, once again, we're going to find out a lot on November 5th about where the committee stacks teams that are sort of on the edge, like a, an Alabama. I think that's a team to watch about where they rank them. Is Alabama still in that top 12 in their eyes after a loss to Vanderbilt and Tennessee? Or is Alabama maybe in the, the – Mid-18, I think they're 15th right now in the AP poll. Are they a little bit further down? Or are they just right? It's going to be really interesting to see how they measure. I think that's the team to watch when you're thinking of SEC bias, if we wanted to call it that. Is, okay, they have a supposedly ugly loss to Vanderbilt on the road, even though Vanderbilt's a much-approved football team. Ranks Vanderbilt. Image play out? How does that image play out to the college football playoff committee? Is their criteria different this year with both teams? Is it more, let more margin for error? When you're looking at sort of the at-large bids, it's going to be fascinating, man. I'm actually, this is the most excited I've been for a ranking show. I mean, you're going to have so much results on uh, two, that two faithful Tuesday night, but I think I'm more looking forward to seeing where these teams stack up. It's really fascinating, man. A hundred percent. It's like, it's like Christmas morning. You never know what you're going to get, but either way, it's going to be a good time. Uh, again, this is Grayson Mann from TigerNet joining the show. Something I think is going to be really intriguing about this first election show of the CFP rankings is strength of schedule. We've already, we've known for college basketball, strength of schedule that matters a ton. Do you think that's going to have a huge implication on those at large bids more than ever before? Yeah, I think that you're going to have to really stack, you're going to start stacking some of these teams up and it's going to be teams with losses. And so you have to sort of look at where they lost, how they lost, where did they lose? The sort of the, uh, Overlying fact. I mean, you looked at it last year, Matt, and I think Clemson's 
non-con schedule in basketball, the way they scheduled that out, and despite finishing sort of an average spot in ACC play, gets you into the tournament. So we've seen strength of schedule play a big factor. And once again, it's going to be coming down to these teams with one loss of the LSUs, the Tennessee, the Ohio States, where you can stack up Ohio State's resume to a Clemson and go, well, Ohio State's one loss was to Oregon, who is the consensus number one team in the country right now, according to the AP poll. Or you look at Clemson's one loss to Georgia, who has started to find its own group who just beat Texas. So there's a lot of factors that I think are going to play more of a factor in this big, this bigger picture of a postseason because there's going to be more teams looking for a slice of the pie. And even though the pie is bigger, not everyone's going to get a slice. So it's going to come down to a lot of uh, interesting things. You're going to look at team improvement, uh, like a team like Clemson, where they didn't look as good in August, but when you look at them in November, it's two different teams. Uh, a team like Tennessee started out really well. Yeah, they had a good loss at the good win to Alabama, but have they looked as good as maybe their record indicates? So there's going to be a lot of uh, conversation, I think, for the committee. I think their job actually got harder with the 12 team playoff. Yeah. Because the four team, it's not as clear anymore. And I think that's what makes this, this move and expansion really fascinating. Uh, definitely. Again, again, this is Grayson Mann from TigerNet joining the show. And, and I agree with that because most of the time you look at it and it's like, well, if they won their conference and they're the best team in their conference, they get in. Now it's there's that plus more. I think a good a good question to ask you now, when it comes to the whole strength of schedule comparison, I don't know if either of these teams get into the playoffs, but Indiana and Alabama. Indiana's undefeated, seven and zero. Alabama's five and two, but they have the seventh hardest strength of schedule. When it comes to that releasing of uh, of the first CFP rankings, do you think in Alabama? is going to be higher or lower than Indiana? And if so, why? Wow, that's certainly going to be one of those uh, It really culminates in all the questions you've asked me is that if in Alabama, that's 5-2 and two is over the uh, the darling that is Indiana in the Big mm-hmm. Ten. There might be some pitchforks outside the uh, college football <laughs> playoff committee. I honestly wouldn't be shocked, shocked at either result. I know that's sort of a non-answer, but Indiana 7-0. They look really good, and they're, they're really beating opponents down to a pretty significant level. I mean, they've been a fun football team to watch. They have a really fantastic offense. Their defense plays complimentary. They're not sh- skating by into these teams. They just took care of a good Nebraska team that was 5-1 and one on the up-and-up. Uh, they've really survived well against teams like UCLA and Maryland. I think those two losses are going to factor in. It really comes down to how the committee views Alabama and how they've gone on the road twice and lost. This isn't home losses, which I think would have factored a little bit more but, again, it's where does the committee put Alabama? I think that answers a lot of our questions to how they're going to adjudicate the rest of the field. Is Okay, this is an Alabama team that's 5-2. and two. They've, got the, they've got the brand. They've got the recognition as a consistent playoff team. I think those things matter. Now, will it matter as much with DeBoer uh, with the headset than Nick Saban? We'll see. But I think, Matt, and once again, Alabama is a team to watch. If I did pick right now, I think Indiana would be ranked higher just because 7-0 and versus 5-2, and regardless of how you get there, is still really impressive. Indiana is a new name uh, that's also not just skating by teams. They're blowing teams out. Yeah. Right now, I'd have to pick Indiana, but I think, once again, Alabama is that team to watch within the committee. Where do they rank them? Because I think that, I think the, I think that gives us a good idea to where the rest of this field could play out and where this committee's headspace is at for the first 12-team playoff. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Who is the best team in college football Moving forward. Right now, I have to go with Georgia. I think what they did on the road against Texas, a team that I thought was well and beyond the best team in college football, and they just went in there and outcoached them and out physical, really, to an extent. There were some moves that I saw from Kirby Smart. I know he had, he had the meme of he looked like Emperor Palpatine executing Order 66 on that ESPN microphone interview. But, man, Georgia went out there with purpose. I still have concerns about Carson Beck and how this offense operates, but I think their defense continues to be the deciding factor for a lot of these matchups. I know that they have the loss to Alabama on the road, but what they showed me against that in that second half is a team that doesn't quit and rally behind Kirby Smart. So I think if I were to pick Georgia or pick between those two, I would pick Georgia to win again in pretty handily fashion. I know Oregon right now is undefeated and they're number one. We've had a lot of rotation at the number one spot for the last couple of weeks. I think right now Georgia would be my number one. 
and I probably have Oregon and Ohio State following closely behind them. Do you think there's a definitive number one? Do you think Georgia is really the best of the best, or do you think it's more so of an open field? I think Georgia's playing the best football right now, but I don't think that they're the same consensus number one from 2022, if that makes any sense, where yeah. you stack them on, a, on the same field. It's just not, not a contest. I think Georgia right now is maybe the number one team in college football, but based on what we've seen this year, doesn't this sort of remind you of 2007? where there's a lot of rotation, there's a lot of parity. It's been fun. I think Oregon could have an argument for the number one team. Ohio State certainly does. Texas may still be able to if they're able to bounce back well against Vanderbilt. And then you got your ACC crowd, taller about Miami and Clemson, and then the SMU Mustangs are creeping slowly behind. There's a lot of good teams. Is there a great team? Maybe to me that's Georgia right now, but – I would, wouldn't be confident saying there's an overwhelming favorite. I don't know if there is one. I think a lot of pundits have Ohio State and Georgia and Texas in that mix. I would, I would look out for Oregon. I would look out for a Miami. I'd look out for a Clemson. There's a lot of teams right now, Madsen, that could make the argument that they could win the national title. There's a lot about who do you picture holding up the trophy. There's an argument for a lot of teams, and I don't think we've had that in a long time. Definitely. Again, this is Grayson Mann from TigerNet. Grayson, two more questions for you before we wrap it up. Again, make sure to check out his podcast, the Orange Crush, Crush Podcast, a great interview releasing later today. But I have my top five teams that I trust from here on out, right, in terms of who I think is like the best of the best, right? And it's not based off of necessarily the past, but the past and the future of the season. So my top five teams in order are Ohio State, number one, Georgia, number two, Oregon, number three, Texas, number four, Clemson, number five. Now, I know you said that Georgia is the best team in your eyes, but out of those five teams I mentioned, like, what are your thoughts on that ranking? I like it. I think I have a pretty similar list. I, I flip, obviously, Georgia and Ohio State, but I'd probably give the slight edge to Oregon right now over Ohio State just because I'm going to respect the temporary head-to-head, even though I think they're going to face off again. And you might see a seasonal split there, if not a third matchup in the college football playoff. I do think Clemson's one of the five best teams in college football right now. I noticed that none of us are giving Penn State the time of day just because of their history. And I do think that at some point when they play Ohio State, it's going to get ugly. Penn State's terrible. And, I don't want to hear it. Penn State's terrible. They're not They're not a good team. <laughs> none of us, neither of us are going to give them the time of day, and I think <laughs> rightfully so. But yeah, Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, uh, Texas, and Clemson are deservingly the top five teams in the country. They've shown me the most. I think Clemson's had the most growth within that five-team list, just in terms of where they started and how where they are now. They're a sneaky team, but I do want to see the Tigers play uh, heavyweight, which we'll probably get to see them play against Pittsburgh. They look pretty good. They yeah. They Kyle McCord nightmares last night. Felt bad uh, for him. They undefeated. They might be a team to factor into the ACC race if they can – find a way to stay up stay and beat, beat both SMU and Clemson, that would be something to watch. But right now, yeah, Georgia's my number one. Ohio State, and it, it's almost like 1A, B, and C, Batson, because I don't think there's a clear, distinct separation, if that makes any sense. I do think Georgia's the best team right now, but I don't think it's by much. Yeah, so your, your tier is Oregon, Ohio State, Georgia, whatever order, but that's your first tier. And then Texas, right. Clemson, that second tier. I'd maybe put Texas in a tier of their own of, like, I could see it, and then Clemson's just a, I want to see them play a big dog first again okay. before I'm ready to proclaim them as, uh, they're, they're on that fringe contender, and then Texas is in this weird bubble to me, and then Ohio State, Oregon, and Georgia are my, yes, I, I could see them winning the national championship right now. I've seen enough. Yeah, and so in a couple of weeks from now, my last question for you, Grayson, in a couple of weeks, Clemson is going to be traveling to play Pittsburgh on the road after playing Louisville at home and Virginia Tech, who's a tough team, and Blacksburg. But let's just say entering that matchup, Clemson wins their next two ma- or their next two games, Pittsburgh wins the rest of their schedule, and Pittsburgh's undefeated. Do you think that game against Pittsburgh, do you think if, depending on how Clemson wins it and how they look, is that a game that could elevate Clemson in your eyes and also just fan bases countrywide of if Clemson's actually a good team, or is Pittsburgh more of just an undefeated team that lucked their way into it? Well, I think what we're going to see is if Pittsburgh stays undefeated, not only do I think they're going to find themselves within the top 15, 
I think we could have game day in Pittsburgh in a couple of weeks if it shapes out like that. Because in my eyes, that's a playoff game. Uh, you have Clemson, who has one loss, who they lose another game. They're likely, their at-large bid falls apart pretty quickly. And for Pittsburgh, it's an opportunity to clinch the ACC. There could be a spot right there where both teams are, it's a win and you're in Charlotte. And it doesn't matter how the rest of the season plays out because you have that chance to represent yourself in the college football playoff. That could be one of, I think that's the matchup to watch for the rest of the way for the ACC is Clemson and Pittsburgh because I think Pittsburgh is going to stand defeated. They're going to knock off SMU before they play the Tigers, and it's going to be a spot to say, hey, potentially you win and you're going to go face Miami and Charlotte in December. That matchup is going to be really exciting. I have my flight booked. I'm ready. Uh, can we get to mid-November already? Because I just want to see Clemson play against another team in Pittsburgh. But, man, was I wrong about them. I, I think I wrote a story in the summer, Matt, in that we re ranked their toughest teams to play, and I had Pittsburgh as not very high. <laughs> I did not believe in the Panthers after a 3-9 and nine season last year, so maybe understandably so. But, man, what a job Narduzzi has done with Eli Holstein at quarterback. They, they've been unbelievable. They've been a fun watch, and they've gotten some fans to put the butts in seats when usually those are reserved for the Steelers on Sunday. They've been a program to watch on the rise. It's been a lot of fun. And I can't wait for November. It's going to be a gauntlet. It is. It is. And Narduzzi, he always finds a way. Seemingly, every other, every couple of years, he just gets to work. Don't know how, but that's why he's the coach at Pittsburgh. Grayson, thank you for joining the show. I really appreciate everything. And good luck with everything. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you, man.